Hello, thank you so much for joining me today. I want to just talk a little bit about uh, speculative fiction and Octavia E. Butler. We're gonna spend some time today learning about the term speculative fiction, what it means, and, um, and how it fits into uh, the work of Octavia E. Butler. So speculative fiction is an umbrella term. It is an overarching term we use to describe several subgenres. These range from science fiction to fantasy and high fantasy and horror. So it really becomes the umbrella term for all of those uh, genres of literature that really speculate about reality, that push the boundaries and really ask us to rethink what we know of as reality. So Octavia Butler then um, is just an, an incredible um, uh, speculative fiction writer and she's experienced a recent resurgence in popularity. So today we're gonna to learn a little bit about who she is and her contribution to speculative fiction and to literature overall, and understand why it is that people have um, sort of gravitated to her work so much in recent days. So in the beginning, Octavia Butler was born in Pasadena, California. She was an African-American woman who was raised primarily by her mother and her grandmother because her father died when she was very young. Um, so her mother and her grandmother raised her in a very, very strict Baptist home. And this becomes important in her work because so many of her major themes revolve around the idea of belief systems and religion and how it causes people to interact with one another. So we can trace sort of her fascination with that to her own upbringing. She was an incredibly tall girl at a very young age with a deep voice. And so it often resulted in her being very shy and being bullied. So she spent a lot of time in the library. It was her refuge to get away from um, all of the bullies and all of the talk. She spent time reading and writing and really submerging herself into those worlds. When she was about 12 years old, she began to write. Um, she says that a few years before that, she had been watching um, a, a film on television and uh, just thought it was a really horrible film called Devil Girl from Mars. And she said, you know, people get paid to write that. I think I could do a better job. So she started to write at a very young age. Although she was encouraged by her family, her, particularly her mother and her aunt, to do something very practical, uh, she chose to be a writer. And in many ways, her mother supported that because she purchased her a typewriter. And that typewriter was really important for uh, Octavia Butler in terms of beginning to think of and identify herself as a writer. Although she says she had no idea what that meant and she wrote lots and lots and lots of terrible stories, but it really helped her get to the place where she would begin to, to deliver the kind of literature now that makes her incredibly famous. So I want to talk a little bit about sort of the pattern of her life and how it uh, weaves into her work. So she graduated uh, from Pasadena City College in 1968 and she, she did what she terms shift work, which means that she had um, odd jobs and jobs that started at you know odd times of the day because she really wanted to get up very early every morning, uh, two or three o'clock in the morning and practice her writing. So she would write for several hours, then go to her job. And she called it kind of mindless work because she really wanted to be thinking about the worlds that she was building while she was working. She had the opportunity to um, attend the Clarion Science Fiction Workshop um, in the early 70s. And there she met a writer named Harlan Ellison. Now the Clarion Science Fiction Workshop is incredibly important because it was the first um, sort of, um, you know, very serious workshop for writers of speculative fiction. And she had a chance to attend and met Harlan Ellison, who was pretty um, dynamic and formidable and quite famous in his day as a kind of rebel science fiction writer. Uh, Harlan Ellison wrote comic books, uh, short stories, novellas. He wrote for television, including a, an award-winning episode of Star Trek. So he became her mentor and a, a great supporter of her work and encouraged her in her, her bid to become a, a speculative fiction author. It's at this time that she lays the foundation for those very early works, including the Pattern of Series and Kindred. So her, her books um, 
there are uh, five of them that are called the Patternist series because they deal with telepathic humans who connect to one another in what they call a pattern. So they're able to speak to one another's minds. And the most powerful of those humans are actually able to bend people's wills. So she has these five texts. Um, they're collected together in the pattern series in the 80s. Uh, but what happens with Octavia Butler's work is then later on, they, they sort of all come together again in another collection called Seed to Harvest. So published in 2007, you can find um, a, a thicker tome with, uh, with four of the novels in it. I've highlighted Survivor, the book from 1978, because the, that's the one you won't find in any of the collected works. It's the one text that Octavia Butler did not allow to be reprinted once it went out of print. She was very concerned if, with uh, the quality of the work that she was delivering. So as she built the Patternist series and she went back to look at Survivor, she thought that she hadn't spent enough time developing those characters or the world in which they lived. So it's not a, ready, a readily available book. But the rest of the pattern series, um, again, deals with all of these notions of, it's really about human beings and power, what it, what it means to have power over other humans. How do you handle that? What do you do with that? Are you honorable in your intentions? And so she really works through that. However, even though they're written in a, a particular pattern, um, uh, they're, they're published uh, beginning with Pattern Master, if you want to, to engage in the series in a chronological order within the, this, the text, the world of the narratives, then you have to actually read them backward. So you have to start with Wild Seed. You have to start there because it sort of tells the story of how those human beings with their telepathic abilities came to be. And Wild Seed begins in ancient Africa and you end up with Pattern Master, which is about um, a post-apocalyptic world in the future in which, again, those telepathic beings are um, you know, sort of responsible for the ways in which all human beings interact. So that's part of her early work is the Pattern Master series. So I want to take a moment to just talk a little bit about Butler's motivations. Her, her works, all of her papers, so you can see her papers uh, housed in the Huntington Museum in Pasadena, California. So in the Huntington, you can find her notebooks, you can find early drafts of the work that she was doing with her novels, notes to herself. And in particular, there is a section of a notebook that they had, <coughs> pardon me, in which Octavia Butler talks to herself about being a writer. She says things like, I will be a New York Times bestselling author. She says, um, I, I will earn enough money to take care of my mother and myself. I will earn enough money from my writing to send young writers to the Clarion Workshop, particularly writers of color. Um, she says, so be it, stick to it. So we see her really motivating herself at a time when she would have been the only woman of color uh, really writing this type of fiction and writing into a world in which speculative fiction was primarily controlled by characters and stories and narratives and authors who were uh, male and who were white and who were Western in terms of their understanding of the world. So she spends a lot of time talking to herself about who she'll be. And it's incredibly important because in one of those notebooks, as she writes about being a New York Times bestseller, that didn't happen until September 2020. So just recently, her book, Parable of the Sower, became a New York Times bestselling novel. And it was something that she was writing about in the late 70s and early 80s and did not get a chance to live to see. So um, again, people are, are really turning to her work because she asked us to deal with those questions about what it means for us to be human. Again, one of the earlier novels, Kindred, is probably the one that's most taught in classrooms. So 1979, uh, Kindred comes out. It is a, a departure from the work that she's done before in that it's a standalone novel. She only has two in her entire body of work, uh, narratives that are just the one book. The rest are all series. Kindred is, is um, I think, taught in classrooms because it was the most accessible. In her previous work, it really was, um, she had created these entire new ways of thinking about what it meant to be human, whereas we return to something we're more familiar with in Kindred. And it is the story of a modern Black woman in 1976 in Los Angeles, California, who all of a sudden finds herself transported 
back in time to an antebellum plantation. And the book is framed around slave narratives. And I've listed a, a few slave narratives for you if you're interested in that genre. But it really looks at what does it mean to be an enslaved human being? We know with our original slave narratives, they all are autobiographical accounts. They come directly from people who had been enslaved and who uh, had an opportunity to tell the story about what it meant to be an enslaved human being. But with Kindred, um, we, we title that a neo-slave narrative. And I've listed some of the very popular neo-slave narratives for you. And those are texts that are written primarily in the 60s and the 70s um, up through today by authors of color who want to go back and really grapple with the, the content of humanity. What does it mean to be a human being who is enslaved, who has no autonomy over your body, your mind, over your physical labor, over your family, over your community? And what does that look like? And for Butler in particular, she says that she wrote this story because she was in a, in a workshop in, in a class and she heard a young African-American man talk about what he would have done had he been enslaved, that he would have run away, he would have fought back. And she said she really wanted to think about that. What, what would you have done? And so she invents the character of Dana. And the fascinating thing about Dana is she's not just pulled back in time, she's pulled back in time to the very plantation where her uh, relatives live. And so she has to, she meets those people who will eventually give birth to her very own parents. And she is also called in those moments to think about what it means to make sure that those people uh, stay alive. In particular, the son of the plantation owner, the slave owner, who will eventually be her forebear one day. So again, Butler puts us in those very difficult situations where we have to ask ourselves, what does it mean to be human? What would we do to survive? Would we do anything? Would we keep our relatives enslaved? Would we save the lives of the people who enslaved us to stay alive? Those are the kinds of questions that she asks in her text and that she asks us as readers to consider. The next work uh, I term before the MacArthur. So uh, in the, the 80s, Butler creates another series and this time it's called Xenogenesis. So it's collected in, uh, together. You can, you can buy one book and, see all, and get all three of the novels in, in 1989. And then again in 2000, it's reissued and this time it's called Lilith's Brood. So the text uh, before she won the MacArthur uh, Fellowship were Dawn, adulthood rights, and imago. Now these texts are uh, fascinating because they deal with uh, the, the fate of humanity right after nuclear war. So we meet a character named Lilith who has survived, um, you know, the destruction of the planet, and along with very few other human beings. However, an alien species comes along and rescues the few human beings who are left after the war puts them in stasis, but, and then wakes them up one at a time to help them deal with their new reality. Lilith is the person whom, when they wake her, is the one who's most likely to adapt. Again, an, another woman of color, an African-American woman, who, um, when she is, she's, she's uh, awakened to learn that the world that she lived in no longer exists. It's been taken completely from her. How does she adapt to that? And then the other thing about the species, the Owen Kali, who rescued the human beings, is that they are gene traders. And so their, their whole existence is about trading uh, gene material with other beings to create new beings. So, of course, the price for, for saving the last of humanity is to exchange uh, genetic material with them and to create a whole other being. And Lilith becomes the mother of a group of people now who used to be human. And Butler, again, ask us those questions. What, what do we think humanity is? You know, if our physical uh, attributes change, are we less human? Who are we then after that kind of catastrophe? She puts us in those spaces to ask those questions. So right after uh, the, the books in the 80s, we move into a series of, um, of text. Uh, that are called the Parable or Earthsea series. And this is what I call her high career work. This is when people, she becomes internationally known as an author and the Parable of the Sower is written in 1993. 
<coughs> now, I said earlier, I described in the former uh, uh, slide that this that she won the MacArthur uh, Fellowship. This MacArthur is really important because it allows her for the first time to be financially free. So the MacArthur Award comes from the MacArthur Foundation. It's very secretive, but incredibly, um, you know, just sort of people, it, you win, only the people of the highest esteem win it because uh, the, it's secret when, who's nominated and how they're chosen. People just get a telephone call and say, you're a MacArthur Fellow. And when that happened to Octavia Butler, it meant she was awarded several hundred thousand dollars. And so now she could do all of those things that she had written about. She could take care of her mother. She could buy a home. She could stop doing what she called the mindless work and really devote her full time to writing. So it was an incredible turning point for her when she won the MacArthur Fellowship. So I believe that the book that brought her to the attention of that Mark MacArthur Fellowship Committee was Parable of the Sower. Um, she writes that in 93, and there is a sequel called Parable of the Talents in 1998. And this is meant to be a trilogy. She meant to write a third book called Parable of the Trickster, but was not able to get that book written. And again, Parable of the Sower and Parable of the Talents are collected into one, um, one uh, uh, space, and it's called the Earth Seed Series. Also in the 90s, she uh, published a book of short stories called Blood Child and Other Stories and won many, many awards for the individual short stories that are contained in the volume. So that's really the highest point of her career uh, when she's writing in the 90s. So, and then there's after the MacArthur. So after she wins the award, while it was an incredibly freeing experience for her and it allowed her to write in a way that she never had before. She really doesn't produce a lot of work after the MacArthur. She becomes ill and can't really finish the trickster. Uh, she has a, a couple of drafts of chapters, but there isn't a, really a whole concept of the trickster that she can uh, that she can push further into a full novel. So around 2005, she begins to say, okay, let me take a break from that series and she decides to write a vampire novel because they're so popular. She asks herself the question, what is it about the vampire novel that has so many people just fascinated with this, with this uh, character? And so she tries her hand at a vampire novel and it writes her second standalone text called Fledgling. And unfortunately it is her last novel because she passes away in 2006. Fledgling, again, is about um, a young woman of color, a young Black woman who is actually a vampire and doesn't know it. So we meet Shori when she uh, has had a catastrophic accident and she wakes up in a cave and doesn't know who or what she is. So you can see that Butler continues to return us to that question about what makes us human. And also the fascinating thing about Butler and why her work is so important is that she's really the first uh, author, speculative fiction author, to center people of color in her narrative. You will find that in most of her texts, there's a young woman of color who uh, is the protagonist. And so she spends a lot of time helping us understand how it is that people from different perspectives also experience the kinds of questions that she asks in her work. How is it that Shori and Dana and Lilith uh, experience this idea of what it means to be human given the, the circumstances under which they have to live? Also in 2005, we get a republishing, a reprinting of Blood Child and Other Stories. And it includes two additional stories, one called Amnesty and one called The Book of Martha. So that's also issued in 2005 with those new stories. And then we don't see another publication uh, from Octavia Butler until 2014 when her estate publishes uh, two short stories that were found in her papers. And these are uh, published posthumously or after her death. There was a lot of controversy around publishing unexpected stories because these weren't stories that the author ever released for publication. Again, they're found in her papers. And so there were many fans who thought uh, it was disrespectful to publish this work that she never meant to be published, that she didn't think should be published. And then there were fans who thought, uh, but we, we so miss her work. We so want to hear something else from Octavia Butler, that they were very happy to receive this new work. 
I list her awards because it's really important to understand how she was received in the speculative fiction world, in the science fiction world. Again, one of the few women and the only woman of color at the time, the only African-American woman to really be successful and recognized for writing this kind of literature. And the whole speculative genre um, uh, as a whole was uh, really a a popular genre and really not even studied in classrooms in a very serious way until the 70s or so. So it was still a space in which there was a lot of room for her to pioneer, for her to be the first person, for her to gain recognition. And um, what I find fascinating as a person who studies Butler is that, you know, until uh, recent years, you might have gone back to study African American literature and you may not have seen her name. And it was because the study of African American literature is oftentimes um, relegated to that what we call literary fiction and that so much of what she was writing was called popular fiction. And she herself um, had lots of difficulty with labeling. She would not have wanted her work to be labeled she disliked going into a bookstore and only seeing uh, you know, a, her book or anybody else's book in a particular section because she said it really prevented people from exploring the kinds of things that they might like to read. So she wins these awards. I want to mention that the Hugo um, was an incredibly important award because it was the highest award given to speculative fiction writers as well as the Nebula. She again goes on to win other uh, later awards in the late 90s and even early 2000s. Um, she wins in 2012, again, after her death. She's awarded the Solstice Award, which comes from the Nebula um, Award Foundation. Uh, it is a Lifetime Achievement Award, recognizing all of the things that she was able to do in terms of her fiction. And then in 2018, she even has um, there is a mountain on a moon uh, uh, off of Pluto that's named after Octavia Butler. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Parable of the Sower because, again, if we talk about the resurgence and popularity of her work, it has to do with Parable. The, the book itself is, uh, again, an African-American uh, female protagonist who's, in, who's a teenager. She, the book opens when she's about 15 years old. And Lauren lives in an incredibly difficult world. In 1993, when the book is published, nobody could really imagine that, you know, that kind of world would exist. Unfortunately, as we, as we look at our world today, we see so many of the things that Butler warned us about in, in 1993 have already happened. So that novel takes place in the year 2024. And, and again, people were so fascinated because that seems so far off when she published it, but we find that we're, we're, we're there now. So the principal, um, uh, I think, tenant from Parable of the Sower is one that is very popular. It says, all you touch, you change. All that you change changes you. The only lasting truth is change. God is change. This is incredibly important because I think this is what people resonate with in her work, this idea about change. Again, we come back to how, how do we get to where we are? Um, is the place that we are a good place? And if not, how do we change it? So the novel takes place in 2024 and it goes through 2027. And the world in which Lauren lives in 1993 looked like a fantasy world. Lauren lived in a world in which corporations were entrenched in government in which there was incredible in-group and out-group politics, in which public services were too expensive or unavailable to the poor and the working class. She lived in a world that had been affected by global warming, where homelessness was rampant, drug addiction, particularly in Lauren's world, people were addicted to a drug which caused them to set fires. So pyromania was, uh, had hugely impacted Lauren's world violence was rampant in the world that Lauren lived in. But there was also something in the world that Lauren lived in um, that was fantastic at the time. And it was that Lauren uh, suffered from a syndrome called hyperempathy. And for Lauren, uh, it's a very difficult thing because she's able to feel what those around her are feeling. And I think it's incredibly important that Octavia Butler introduces this concept into Lauren's world because Lauren ends up being a leader she ends up stepping into a position when other people are too hurt or broken to move forward to figure out a path. 
So her hyper empathy is key to helping her become a really incredible leader. The characters in Parable of the Sower, of course, the principal character is Lauren Olamina. She lives in a walled community called in, uh, in Robledo, California. So her family and neighbors um, have really relied on this wall to protect them from all of those homeless people, all of the violence, all of the people who don't have anything who live outside the wall. Lauren constantly says to her father and to any, anybody else who will listen, that this is a that the wall is not going to hold up it's not going to last at some point people are going to cross that wall tear it down you know punch a hole in it whatever and then what are we going to do but rather than have that conversation lauren's father and the rest of the adults in her community um just pretend they go no things are going to get better they're going to go back to the way that they used to be and it's a it's a point of contention for lauren because her father is the really the leader of the community reverend olamina he's a a baptist minister and we can see butler's um her own uh sort of childhood experiences coming to play in her characters here um and and people look up to him in the community they follow him in the community but he uh, is not, he's, he's uh, not prepared to have the kind of conversations that Lauren wants to have, particularly because she's such a young person. There are other principal characters in the book, including Lauren's brothers and uh, her friend, and things that happen to them as they try to sort of eke out a living in this very um, difficult situation where, where it's so dangerous to leave the wall. And so, so many people who, people who have jobs are only those people who are able to work from home. So again, it's one of the reasons why people resonate so much with the text today is because you suddenly find yourself working from home in situations you never did before. And that had become normal for the characters in um, Parable of the Sower. Eventually, the wall is breached and Lauren uh, has to figure out how to survive. She decides that the best thing for her to do is to try to make it to Canada and as she goes on the trip, uh, as, she, as she's walking the roads, these very dangerous, violent roads, she collects people with her. So they, they, they sort of become a community on the road. And as they become this community, Lauren develops what she calls um, tenants for living. She collects them in her notebook, which she calls Earth Seed, the Book of the Living. And when she's fairly sure about these things that she believes, she begins to share them with the other people who are on the road with her. Now, many critics uh, identify what Lauren does as creating a new religion. I'm not so sure she so much creates a new religion as she helps people understand exactly what it is they need to believe in in order to survive. So we, we see Lauren as she's on the road with all of the different characters, and she even meets other hyper empaths, which she never had before. And we're able to learn even more about the dangers of being a hyper empathetic person, the dangers of being able to feel what the other people feel around you and how many unscrupulous people are willing to take advantage of that. Um, to hurt Lauren, you only have to hurt the people who are next to her. So it becomes, um, again, a, a point of, of something she has to deal with as she figures out how to lead these people and how to survive. She begins in Robledo, California, and they eventually come together to make a new community and they call it Acorn. Um, it's just poetic that um, Robledo is um, in Spanish, a derivative of the word acorn. So she, she leaves this one place and ends up in another that very much reflects um, the loving community that she had when she was uh, growing up in Robledo. The structure of her novel. It's, of course, as I said, meant to be the first in a trilogy um, after Parable of the Talents, but Butler isn't able to, to finish the, the third in, in that grouping. Uh, it's epistolary. There are letter writings. It's journal writings. It's Lauren talking to herself and trying, trying to think things out for herself. Uh, the timeline in the novel, you will see what happened in the years 24, 25, 26, and 27. It's also a Bill Dunn's Ramon and that it's a coming of age story. And like the traditional Bildungsroman, uh, where the young protagonist has to be separated from family and friends and all that they know, 
in order to survive, it is out of that survival mechanism that they become adults and that they formulate new families and communities of their own. The, each of the chapter headings is a tenant. It is one of those sayings like, all you touch, you change. Um, and, and each of those chapter headings tell us how Lauren is developing in her understanding, in the creation of what she believes in, in her ability to survive. So they become incredibly important. And, and really, Earth Seed itself, the, this, this book of philosophies and understandings and beliefs that Lauren develops have become so popular that even outside of the world of the novel, there are many people who adopt those tenets as guiding principles. So again, we start in the walled community of Robledo and we end up in this small community uh, of people who are survivors. We start in one community that's dying and end up in a community that is being born. Some of the principal uh, things to think through in the in, in Parable of the Sower are again belief systems and that idea of change. All you touch, you change, and all that you change changes you. It allows us to go into those spaces to ask ourselves, how do we deal with change? Because it's inevitable, we can't, we, it's going to come. So what do we do with it when it comes? And what Lauren would say is that you shape that change. So you can't escape from it or pretend it's not there, but you have to shape it when it does come. The novel deals with community, communities that are breaking apart and communities that are coming together. Disability, Lauren's own uh, perception of hyperempathy as a disability, and also that it's uh, dangerous to her because so many people can't hurt or control her if they understand uh, how she interacts with her environment. The physical environment is important in the text because Lauren lives in a world in which there have been the ravages of global warming. She lives in California and her California is in a perpetual state of drought. Um, wildfires rage daily in her California and in 1993 that seemed so far away but as we think about it today it describes the California that we know. Again hyper empathy is important. Immigration is important. Lauren her only choice when her community falls apart when her community is violated and devastated is to try to move and her in her attempt to move, she, she's going to immigrate to Canada. So having to, in many ways, be a kind of refugee out on the road alone is one of the themes in the text. Political divisions are huge in the text. Why are there no services? Why does the average person not have enough? Um, it has nothing to do with their ability or their education. They can be as educated as, as possible, but there are no jobs. And so what happens, and in Lauren's world, huge corporations buy up towns and have people work for them. It, it's similar to a system, I think, um, that we might, we might describe it as, as sharecropping and that they don't own anything and everything they, they consume, they have to pay the, the company for. So, so again, that's why people are fascinated with this text is because they can see so many of the things that Butler addressed really happening in our world. Violence is huge in the text. And of course, we deal daily with violence and the ways in which we uh, treat and perceive one another. And then the theme of walls. So Lauren begins in this walled place with people who believe in a wall, with people who think a wall is the answer. And in the end, because they relied so heavily on it, they weren't prepared when those walls fell down. I would like to invite you to, to uh, sort of go to your um, internet browser and look up the Octavia E. Butler Literary Society. Uh, there are many literary societies run by uh, professors at different colleges across the United States uh, where they're involved in researching and writing and teaching the works of different authors. And there is an author society developed to Octavia Butler. What's a little bit different about this society though is that it invites not just scholars of Octavia Butler's work, but just people who love to read her work or even students to come together and to have opportunities to talk about this work. The Butler Society hosts an, a conference every two years if you're interested. You can go to the website. You can, um, um, you know, and they accept papers from, from everyone, from people who just like to read her work to those scholars who are, who are researching and writing and publishing about Octavia Butler. 
So I hope that I have interested you in further study of Octavia Butler. I provided some further reading. If you want to read about speculative fiction, if you want to read about Octavia's uh, Butler's place in speculative fiction, and overall how she has contributed to the field of literature as a woman, as an African American woman, how she's opened doors um, to people who did not think they could write that kind of literature before. And that she's also helped to us to understand how important speculative fiction is for its world building properties. So many of the answers that we look for in our, what we term our reality, um, have to first be imagined. And speculative fiction is a place in which we can uh, experiment with different ideas, with which we consider different things in a relatively safe space to then uh, think through and then bring those things back into our reality to think about how might we solve some of those challenges. So in terms of her world building, Octavia Butler has been an incredible pioneer to help us understand that fictional world building, that world building in our literary imaginations is so important to solving the problems in our real lives. So I wanna thank you and I hope that you will uh, read more about Octavia Butler.